I hope you guessed which data structures we're going to be talking about today. But why? Queues and stacks, they seem so fundamental that they require no explanation, right? But let's be honest, have you thought about queues and stacks outside of the interview questions? If not, you might be missing out. In this video, we're going to be looking at these two frenemies. What are the distinctive characteristics of each? Where are they actually used? How to implement them or use them in the code. And we're going to look at a few different languages because they approach queues and stacks very different. And most importantly, in the last part of this video, we're going to be looking at some real problems that can be solved using queues and stacks. And mind you, not just interview problems. Everybody knows what a stack is. Even if you're not familiar with the term for some reason, you absolutely know what it is because it's everywhere around us in real life. Think, for example, about a stack of plates. You can only place a plate on top of the stack without lifting everything. And also, if you need to take something from the middle of the stack, you would have to lift everything up before you get to that desired plate. I think this is a good example because while lifting the plates that you don't want to use is very possible, it can be quite heavy and you probably don't want to do this all the time. So you're trying to find some optimal approach to how you handle your plates. And this is exactly what you have to do with your data structures. It also illustrates the idea of last in first out quite well, because especially if it's a stack of similar plates, you would only use the top ones. And if you don't go through all of them all the time, there is a chance that the item at the bottom of the stack will never be used. But while this analogy illustrates it quite well, it doesn't have a lot to do with computers. So let's look at some more relevant example. As an illustration of how stacks work, we're going to create our own undo and redo pile. Let's say I want to draw a rectangle. Now I'm adding drawing a rectangle to my undo pile. Now I'm going to add a triangle and add drawing a triangle. And maybe I want to paint my rectangle green. Or maybe not. Let me undo this action. I'm going to take painting the rectangle green from the undo pile and undo the action. It goes into the redo pile. Because in case we want to redo that, we simply move it back to the undo pile. In reality, we wanted to paint our rectangle red. Now, since new action is added to the undo pile, the redo pile is emptied and we cannot redo anything anymore. Just as stacks or even more, queues don't require a lot of explanation. We all have been in a queue, whether it is in a supermarket, at a bar or even a traffic jam. As in the real world, the first one in the queue is the first one to get out and the last one in the queue stays the longest. It is incredibly easy to visualize a queue using a notepad. If you add the tasks one by one and then implement them from the top. If you save your videos to the watch later list, and by the way, how many videos do you have there? Do you use the stack approach or a queue approach? Do you watch the top videos first because they're most relevant? Or do you go from the bottom ones because you want to clear out your list? I'm genuinely curious. So how do we implement queues and stacks? As you will see in the following sections with queues and stacks in different languages and the problems that we are trying to solve, the implementations can differ a lot. Another thing that can differ as well is the names. We're using queue and queue and add and remove interchangeably, as well as the front and back and the head and the tail. Easiest way to understand the implementation of the queue is to use a dequeue. And in most languages, the implementation of the queue is a double linked list. The convenience of using this structure is because we can explain both queue and a stack. If we want to implement a queue and add another element, we're looking at the tail of the queue or the back of the queue, and we're linking the element as next, of course, moving the tail. If we want to remove the element from the queue, we remove it at the head and move the head to the next element. And for the stack, we are connecting the elements at the head moving the hat and the same for removal. We are removing the element at the hat, moving the hat backwards. But this is not the only implementation that is possible to have. Another way to implement the queue or the stack is to use an array. And it may seem weird, but in reality, as you will see, it's quite intuitive. You will have a hat pointer and the tail pointer that you can move when you're removing or adding the element. And exactly the same logic for a stack. If you remove an element, you move the hat backwards. And when you 
add an element they had moves to the next position. You might think, why would somebody go for an array implementation? You have to take care of the head and the tail yourself. You have to check for emptiness by comparing head and tail. You have to care about the size of the stacks and handle situations when you add elements to the stack and it's already full. Well, the answer to that question is actually in the last section of the video that goes over the common problems. Wait a little bit to find it out. Remember that Q or a stack are a concept, a data structure, an idea, and you can implement them using, well, practically anything. I know that some of the tools are using append logs as a queue. You can use persistent stack, like some of the functional languages. They do not change an object, they create a new object when the value is added or removed. Or you can even implement a queue with stacks or a stack with queues. I still cannot believe people ask this during the interviews. Anyway, let's look at how different languages are using queues and stacks, and I have to say, it can get quite confusing. By the way, I keep getting requests about making videos about coding questions and going through the code of some problems, but I know that you guys are coming from very different backgrounds and you have very different languages that you are using. So if you let me know in the comments what are the preferred languages for these coding videos, I would really appreciate it. The easiest way to create a queue in JavaScript is to use an array, but you probably don't want to do this because this shift operation is going to cost you an arm and a leg. An array of the fixed length, however, is great for the circular queue implementation. It may look scary, but as you will see in this section with real life scenarios, this is one of the best data structures possible, even in JavaScript. And the most obvious way to create a queue is to use a linked list, which is not a thing in JavaScript for some reason. Python as usual is clean and effective. You just use the queue and it basically gives you everything you need in pretty optimal time. Unless you're feeling creative or on the interview and need to create your own linked list. Java in that sense is pretty similar to Python. It has a DQ structure or for a queue you can just use linked list. As you've already guessed, the circular queue is implemented pretty much the same in every language and you kind of have to do it yourself. What about the stacks? Well, quite similar. You can use an array, you probably don't want to. You can use linked list, you have to write it yourself. As I mentioned before, the great advantage of using the queue is that you can use it for both stacks and queues. And the great thing about stacks is that you can use an array for them. It's not going to be as bad as for the queues because you're not shifting all of the elements, you're only adding them in the end. You just have to eat up the costs of resizing an array. But when it comes to Java, just stick to the queue. Worked for me quite well. Okay. Now let's get into the really interesting stuff and we're going to start with the first problem and as I promised it's going to be difficult and relevant. So here's the problem. And if you think I'm joking, I promise you I'm not. If you look at this expression, or better yet, a more complicated expression, it's quite easy for you to understand because this is what we've learned as kids. This is extremely clear. We do 2 times 3 first because this separation takes priority and then we add 1. And we don't have to explain to ourselves how it works, but believe it or not, this is quite difficult for a computer. And not because it's a computation, it's because of the computational notation. We need to teach our computer how to recognize this expression. First, let's separate this whole equation into the operands and operators. And let's add a couple of stacks for each. As you know, in math, different operators take different priorities. So we have to do multiplication before we move on to the addition. And this is exactly how a parsing is going to work. We're going to go left to right and we're going to put the operands or the operators into the corresponding stacks. This is the end of the equation and there are no more higher priority operators. So we're going to pop this operator and the two numbers it can operate on. And we're going to replace 2 and 3 by the result of this operation. Now we do the same operation again. We pop the operators and the numbers we have to work on. And once we're done, we replace it with the result. As soon as the operator stack is empty, we can pop the result of our equation. The way that this equation was actually presented to the computer can also be written in a postfix notation and it's actually quite handy. I'm using my camera right now to record a video about cues and stacks. My camera records at 30 frames per second. There is also a processor 
that takes these frames and encodes them into the final video. It can potentially apply some other settings, but the idea is these frames need to be processed before I can access them. So how do we do that? The naive solution would be to do it one by one. I take the frame, I process it, I take the frame, I process it. But the problem with that approach is that we need to guarantee that the processor is working as fast as the frames are taken and it's not always possible and it does not leave any room for error. So if my processor is taking more time than I thought it would, the new frames will just not be taken and I don't think you can learn a lot about cues from this time lapse. So how can we solve it? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is to introduce a buffer. The frames go into the buffer, the processor takes them from the buffer and everybody's happy, right? Well, no, if we think about the memory overflow. Imagine something happened to the processor, it got stuck for a while and the camera just kept recording new frames. Now the buffer is an enormous size buffer and well, the video is not recorded anymore because we have a memory overflow problem. This is also not ideal because I'd rather lose one or two frames than have the camera stop working completely. What do we do? Well, we lose one or two frames. <laughs> We're gonna introduce something called a ring buffer. And if you're really into this topic and you try to Google it, you're gonna be surprised how many applications ring buffers have. It's like one of the fundamental data structures that we are using in computing. Remember this array-based queue implementation that we talked about before? This, this is it. Something that seems weird when you look at it is actually used everywhere. So how does it work in our example? The camera that's recording the frames is placing them at the back of the queue and the processor is taking them from the front of the queue. If the processor is getting too slow, then the queue wraps around and starts overwriting old frames. It does lead to loss of some of the frames, but not as much as we would lose in any other scenario. And the memory allocated to the ring buffer stays the same, so we don't have to worry about that. If you're already working in a professional settings, then you are very, very familiar with observability tools. And if you're not, get familiar with it, it's very important. The idea of the observability tool of any kind is that it gives you an insight in the application performance. But the idea of observability is not just looking at your numbers from yesterday and figuring out that your app is getting slower or not. You look at the logs, you see some errors and you do something about it or you detect performance problems. This is only one side of a coin and the most important one is the real-time observability. Let's say you want to get an alert if for the last five minutes the average latency is above a certain threshold. It sounds really common sense and pretty easy, right? Well, you have to think about how you implement this because your metrics are coming in continuously. So your five minute window is constantly sliding. In fact, it's actually called a sliding window uh, if you look at the algorithm. So you would have to recalculate your values on and on and on, which is not extremely computationally efficient. And if you have a lot of computations to perform, uh, your data can be a little bit outdated for a real-time scenario. So what do we do? We use queues. Queues are the most natural way to implement a sliding window. Imagine this is the stream of metrics we are receiving. In the last 60 seconds we received three of the metrics and we're adding them to the queue. Now we can calculate some kind of parameter that we want, probably an average latency or the 95th percentile. We're just gonna mark it as R for result. Then we get a new metric coming in. Now this metric is outside of the 60 second window, so we discard it. Now we have a new set of metrics to work with and we calculate a new value. And instead of recalculating it completely, we can just add this value and remove the previous value from the result, which can be quite handy if your number of metrics is not three, but rather 3000. And as you can guess, when we get a new value, and for example, these two are not in the 60 second window anymore. We're left with this as our set of metrics for the sliding window and we calculate a new result. And if this result is above a certain threshold, we can send an alert. I hope this video wasn't too overwhelming because from all of the information we could have shared, only this was actually shared. Let me know what you think about this video in the comments. Subscribe to the channel to not miss new videos about data structures and I'll see you in the next one. I like using kids' toy for it because we need to teach them young.